Yo everyone, welcome back to House Groups. Hey, we're super excited for you guys to be here tonight. Um, we're excited to keep uh, continuing our study in the book of 1 Peter. Um, we're almost done. This is our last full month of House Groups. Um, it's kind of crazy to think that this semester is almost like done and gone. Um, it's really wild. So we have, um, I think there's five Tuesdays in this month. So we have the three groups, we're off for Thanksgiving, and then we come back for worship night. And then in December, we will have uh, one, one last group, and then we will have a Christmas party. The Christmas party is gonna be super fun. It's on December 14th. Um, we're going to do a bunch of crazy things like uh, Christmas costumes. So if you want to come as Santa or if you want to come as an elf, uh, we're just really encouraging Christmas attire. So if you have an ugly sweater that you like or if you have a cute sweater that you like, wear it. It's going to be really fun. Uh, we'll have some cookies and karaoke and Christmas trivia and all those crazy things. So that will be on December 14th. Um, and then at the end of December, we're gonna be going to cross conference. This is going to be a really, really good time and you don't wanna miss it. It's December 29th through January 1st. Um, we'll be going to Louisville, Kentucky. Teachers that are there are gonna be taking us through 1 Corinthians. So we'll go through 1 Corinthians and there will be uh, opportunities for us to gather together at the conference and talk about what we've learned. And there will also be these really cool uh, breakout groups um, and each group has something different to deal with. So there's some about like being a missionary or how can you evangelize to your friends or what does the Bible say about this and just some really cool hot topics that we're super excited to um, dive into. Um, but yeah, other than that, if we don't see you here at groups, we will see you here at worship night at the end of the month on the 30th. Um, but we love you guys and we'll see you later. All right, everybody, welcome back to the house. Uh, we're really glad you're here. If you got your Bible, go ahead and open it up to 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, we're ending chapter three tonight. Like we said last week, we are over the hump. We've got two chapters left after tonight, and we'll be done with First Peter before uh, we break for Christmas. So we've got a few weeks off for Thanksgiving, and then uh, we'll come back and finish this letter, which will be awesome. But um, let me read our text for tonight, and hopefully you have your Bible. If not, no shame. Uh, grab your phone. We'd love for you to look at these verses that I'm going to mention tonight just so you can see things for yourself. Um, don't take my word for it. In fact, tonight is actually a really good example of what do you do when um, the text isn't very clear? Uh, what do you do when you run into something in the Bible that you have no idea what it means? Um, don't just make up a meaning. Don't just assume a meaning. And I would even say don't just skip it either. Um, find some time, plan out some time where you can dedicate to wrestle with the text. Um, that's what we're going to do tonight. I don't claim to know exactly what this passage means. And uh, some of you are like, what? Uh, well, let me just say this. Uh, Martin Luther is quoted as saying, like, this is a spectacular text uh, to which I don't know what it means. Uh, Martin Luther doesn't know what Peter means here. Uh, John Piper doesn't know what Peter means here. So um, I don't say that till I give myself an out. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I think it means. Um, and I'm on different camps than John Piper in this one, and I don't say that arrogantly. Uh, John Piper said um, he disagrees with some of his colleagues, but he said I also don't hold a lot of weight in the view that I have. Um, so I don't say that to like try to sound impressive or whatever, but I do say, let me give you a few options of what this text means, and then uh, we don't have time to dive into every single one of them, but I do want to show you what I think it means and how I kind of came to my conclusion. And uh, you may be able to shoot some holes in it and that's totally fine. Uh, like I said, I would kind of agree with Piper in that I don't hold a lot of weight into this interpretation, um, but I think it's biblical. I think you can make a case for it in the Bible and uh, would love to try to make that case for you. So let's read this incredible passage together from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, it says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Now, that's an incredible verse, right? Like, people refer to that verse a ton because it's the gospel in one verse. Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous, which was him, for the unrighteous, us, that he might bring us to God, right? What an incredible verse being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And this is where the plane goes down. He says this, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water 
Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as, a, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So, what in the world does this passage mean? Like I said a minute ago, um, there's multiple interpretations of this. Uh, I'm going to give you kind of a flyover of three of them, and then I'm going to dive into the third, um, because I think it's the one I agree with. Like I said, you could probably convince me otherwise. Uh, so let's go through it. Um, the first one is what does this whole passage mean about um, the Spirit of Christ proclaiming to the spirits in prison, all of those things. One of those, um, this is actually the one that John Piper holds to, is that it refers to um, Christ, the Spirit of Christ, on Noah, calling Noah a prophet, preaching to those who were disobedient and lived in the days of Noah. Um, it's kind of a very simple interpretation. There's probably other verses that Piper pulls in to support it. But he thinks it just means, and he even references 1 Peter chapter 1. If you remember from a month or two ago, we talked about in, verse, or in chapter 1, if you want to flip over there, you can, in verses 10 and 11... Um, Peter says this, he says, um, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Um, so Piper would say that this spirit that went to preach um, to the spirits in prison, what's he referring to? He's referring to um, that this spirit of Christ that was on Noah, um, through Noah, he was preaching to those who were disobedient and those who lived in Noah's day. Um, I don't know if that fully, probably in your mind, um, explains where the prison is or what that means as far as the prison goes. Um, we could go down that road, but like I said, I would encourage you to. Um, I'm going to show you what I think all of that means in this other interpretation, but um, that's one of the cases. Um, Second interpretation is the spirits in prison reverse, refers to Old Testament believers who died and were liberated by Christ between the time of Good Friday and Easter. So Jesus dies on Good Friday and he goes and preaches to um, Old Testament believers. Um, they were, there's a, it's a, <laughs> Paul's probably laughing right now. There's a term in, the Old Testament called Abraham's bosom, this intermediate state where um, Jesus Christ was not in heaven yet, right, while he's living in the New Testament, that old saints, Old Testament believers, when they died, they went to this intermediate state called Abraham's bosom. Um, we still believe, we hold to, I don't know if, I don't want to speak for everybody, but the majority of New Testament believers uh, believe in an intermediate state right now. Um, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Um, but there's a new heaven and a new earth coming when all of us, those who have died before us and those who are still living, um, if you and I are still alive when Christ returns, that the dead in Christ will be raised and we will come and that we'll be caught up to with them and Jesus will take us all. It's that point where we'll get new resurrection bodies and Jesus will take us all into the new heaven and the new earth at the same time forever. But until then, like your loved ones, my loved ones that have died, um, Paul says, Absent with the body, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus told the thief that today he would be with him in paradise, right? Um, so there is this place where um, believers who have died before us, their souls are currently, and it's called the intermediate state, where it's paradise. Their souls are completely at peace and at rest with God, but even they have something to look forward to. And that's the return of Christ. When they return with him, those of us that are still alive are caught up with them in the air. We all come down and Jesus Christ gives all of us new resurrection bodies and we usher into the new heaven and earth, the new kingdom forever and ever and ever. Um, this interpretation would mean that Jesus went and freed those people who were Old Testament saints who were waiting for him uh, to accomplish salvation for us. Whole bunch of places you could go with that. And then the last one, and this is probably the most weird, and I didn't pick it because it's weird. I picked it because um, I think Peter mentions this um, one other time, and I think Paul even mentions this. Um, I think others mention this, and I want to show it to you. So um, 
The third interpretation is that this passage describes Jesus' proclamation of victory and judgment over fallen angels. Um, and you're like, oh boy, right? So strap in. Um, I think this passage is referring to um, Jesus dying and his spirit going and proclaiming victory to a specific group of evil fallen angels um, back in the days of Noah who were punished and wiped out and sent to prison to be in chains of darkness. And Jesus went and proclaimed once he had won the victory for us that sin was defeated, that Satan was defeated, and that they were defeated um, because of his victory. So where in the world am I getting that? Um, let's go there, all right? So here's, why, here's where I want to start. Um, Jesus, physical body, dies at Calvary. Uh, when he was on the cross, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, right? So right there on the cross, Jesus is committing his spirit to the Father. Um, his physical body dies. Jesus goes to heaven in his spirit. Um, his body is dead and buried, but his spirit was welcomed and received in heaven. Um, because I've mentioned this verse already, but Jesus told the thief on the cross, he said, today, not in three days, you will be with me in paradise, right? So it's not like Jesus' spirit was just dead for three days. His body was dead. Physically, Jesus was dead. His earthly dwelling, his body was dead. His spirit goes into heaven with this thief on the cross, right? He says, today, you will be with me in paradise. So body buried, Jesus' spirit goes into heaven. And then um, Peter says in uh, verse 18, that uh, he says, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, right? So his spirit is alive, not three days later, but when he dies, he's received in heaven. Um, and then he says, he went and made a proclamation. Um, he was made alive in the spirit. And then in verse 19, it says, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So Jesus' spirit goes to a prison somewhere and makes a proclamation to these other spirits. Now here's what I want you to know. Um, spirits, lowercase here, these spirits in prison, um, typically in scripture, almost always in scripture, spirits means one of two things. It either means angels or it means demonic spirits. Um, it's typically what Scripture is referring to when it refers to lowercase spirits. They're either angels or demons. Um, and what do we know from this text? That these spirits were in prison. Um, so it doesn't sound like incredible angelic beings. Um, and then in verse 20, Peter will say that these spirits were disobedient in the days of Noah, right? Um, so you've got these spirits. They were disobedient back then. Um, they're in this prison that Jesus went and made a proclamation to. Um, so I take it to mean that these spirits in prison were these demonic spirits um, that were put into prison in the days of Noah. All right, so they're specifically, and I'll show you in just a second, I think they were angels. They were these angelic beings who rebelled with Satan, and they were cast out from heaven, and they were put into a prison. Um, not the evil spirits that are allowed to roam the earth today, not demonic spirits who are messengers of Satan today, but like a unique, specific group of angelic beings who rebelled, who disobeyed in the days of Noah, and they were put into a prison. And you're like, well, I'm, yeah, it's just as confusing to me too. But Jesus goes and makes a proclamation to this group um, of former angels, now demonic spirits, uh, spirits that sin was beaten, that Satan was beaten, and therefore they were beaten. Um, so look at verse 20. He says, because they formerly did not obey. So these spirits that the Spirit of Christ went and proclaimed, made a proclamation to, did not obey. And then he says, when they didn't obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few... That is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. The few that are brought safely through the water 
clearly know his family. But here's what I want you to do. Put a finger or a bookmark or something there <clears throat> in 1 Peter 3 and flip over a few pages to 2 Peter chapter 2. All right, flip over a few pages. 2 Peter 2 verses 4 and 5 says this. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So, it would be very hard for you to convince me that Peter is not referring to the same incident that he's referring to in 1 Peter 3, right here in 2 Peter 2. It would be extremely difficult for you to convince me that those aren't the same occurrence, same circumstance. And Peter says, God did not spare angels, right? Which we could argue from Scripture that that's who the spirits were. Angels when they sinned. So spirits who are disobedient in 1 Peter 3, angels when they sinned in 2 Peter 2, but what did he do? He cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness, right? Spirits in prison, angels who are cast into hell, who are disobedient, chains of darkness to be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, so God did not spare these ancient spiritual beings, but he preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, his family, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Right? So, same author saying that these angels are spirits. They sinned. They were disobedient. Um, they were committed to chains. They were put in prison, in darkness, in hell, right? To be kept there until judgment. It would be very hard for you to tell me that that's not the same thing. Um, and then he mentions Noah. Like, he connects that event again to Noah. He says in 1 Peter 3, in the days of Noah, um, he says right here, he didn't spare this ancient, these ancient beings, but he preserved Noah and he saved Noah. And then, you might not know where Jude is. It's towards the end of your Bible, but flip over to Jude. Um, I would say chapter 1. There's only one chapter of Jude. So flip over to Jude, um, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation, so it's like really close to the end of your Bible. Um, flip over there, and uh, I want you to, to see something in uh, Jude 1, or just Jude verse 5 uh, through 7. It says this, Now I want to remind you all, though, <clears throat> I want to remind you, comma, grammar helps when you read the Bible. Uh, now I want to remind you, Although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So this is referring to the Exodus, right? He saved the Israelites out of Egypt. He destroyed the Egyptians who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Right? So here we are again. He said, save the Israelites, destroy the Egyptians, and then there are some angels somewhere who did not stay within their own position of authority, but they left their proper dwelling, um, and he has kept them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So, Angels left their position, and because of that, because of their disobedience, because of their sin, God has put them in prison, put them in chains until the day of judgment. And then he says this in verse 7, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as, a, as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So, here's what's crazy. Look at verse 7 we get some more insight into what these angels did. They not only left their position of authority, but it says, just as. So in the same way. And then he says, likewise, in the same verse, verse 7, he says, likewise, they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire as an example by undergoing punishment. Uh, they serve it as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. 
So just as Sodom and Gomorrah, likewise like Sodom and Gomorrah, these angels, they left their position of authority and they did the same thing that Sodom and Gomorrah did. They engaged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires. Now what in the world is going on here? I hope you're staying with me. I hope you're looking at these verses for yourselves and not taking my word for it. Um, what did they do? Who are these people? Last section that we're going to go to, flip to the front of your Bible because we have to go to the days of Noah to Genesis chapter 6. All right? So go to Genesis chapter 6, last place that we're going. Joel, you can sneak out. Joel Tyler, everybody. He's a. Uh, I thought you were leaving. Um, he's uh, he's had heard enough of angels committing sin and sexual immorality. Um, actually, he probably has to just run an errand. So Genesis six, here it is. It says this. If you're at Genesis six, um, if you're not there, pause it real quick and get there. Um, verses one through four. This is what it says. It says when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Um, so, what in the world is going on here? Now, if you remember, we're not going to dive deep into the context of Genesis, but you've got creation, Adam and Eve, the fall in chapter 3. You've got tracing the descendants of Adam and Eve to Noah in chapter 5. You've got Cain and Abel in chapter 4. Um, and then we've got wickedness on the earth in chapter 6. So when man began to multiply on the face of the land, you've got all this wickedness. We trace the genealogy in chapter 5 of Genesis and it's just so-and-so died and he died and he died and he died. You've got sin rampant on the earth, wickedness on the earth. Um, God, in a few verses, will even say he regretted making humanity because their wickedness was so bad. But man began to multiply on the face of the earth, face of the land, and daughters were born to them, right? So you've got men multiplying. Obviously, that means more men are being born, and you've got daughters being born. And then it says this, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. Now, here's where the interpretation goes one of two ways. Some people think that the sons of God in this passage mean descendants of Adam and Seth. Now, if you don't know who Seth is, Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel, right? The righteous one, not wasn't perfectly righteous, but the good kid died. Cain, the murderer one, murderous one still lived. So God says, I'm, my blessing's not gonna go through him. You're gonna have another child. His name's gonna be Seth. And my lineage, my blessing is gonna go through the lineage of Seth, right? Genesis 3.15, um, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. So the seed of the woman of Adam and Eve have to go through, um, it's the story of Genesis, is just the seed of the woman, um, descendant after descendant after descendant of Adam and Eve. They can't use Cain because Cain was a murderer. So God says, I'm not going to use him. I'm going to use your next son. His name's going to be Seth. Um, and then ultimately from Adam to Seth's line, you get Abraham, you get David, you get all these patriarchs, um, you get Jesus. Uh, the seed of the woman ultimately crushes the head of the serpent. But that's neither here nor there. Um, a lot of people think that in Genesis 6, that the sons of God, meaning that the people in Adam and Seth's lineage, that the people that were direct um, in the direct line of the seed of Adam and Eve, that they intermarried basically with unbelievers. Um, that's what they take it to mean. I think that this sons of God um, actually refers to these angels or these spirits. Um, especially since Abraham is not till Genesis 12 when God actually calls um, Israel his son, his firstborn, all those kind of things. I think that these sons of God were 
angels, that they were spirits. Um, yeah, that's what it's referring to. So you've got these angels who see these daughters of men, and what did they do? As Jude said, they abandoned their proper authority, their proper abode, their proper dwelling, and they came down and they intermarried with these women. And you've got these group of people called the Nephilim. And they, were, uh, they went after strange flesh, as Jude 1 verse 7 says. And then God ends up casting them because they did this into chains until the judgment day. As crazy as that sounds. Um, so then in verse 3 of Genesis 6, God says, My spirit will not strive with man forever because he is man, because he, man, is flesh, and then God says, after 120 years, or he says their days will be 120 years, and then God will wipe them out with the flood. And his family tree of fallen spirits intermarried with daughters of men will end with the flood. So I think what this means, if you look at Jude, if you look at 2 Peter, is that you've got these sons of God, these angels. They left their proper dwelling. They went and married human beings. And because of that, God says, my spirit will not abide in them forever because man is flesh. And he says, his days, these Nephilim, um, the word uh, Nephil actually means to fall. They were these fallen group of people. That's why we call them the Nephilim, that they were fallen. Um, God says that he will wipe them out in 120 years. Their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, verse 4, were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were mighty men, so they were believed to be giants um, who were of old and they were men of renown. They were famous, right? Why? Because you've got these angelic beings marrying human women, and they were the Nephilim. They were the fallen ones. They left their place of authority. They committed um, unnatural desires, sexual immorality with people they were never supposed to be with, with human women. And because of this, God doesn't immediately wipe them out. He says, I will wipe them out in 120 years when the flood comes. And the flood comes, God wipes out these people like he promised. And he says, my spirit's not gonna stay with them. God decides to wipe them out, and instead of saving these angelic beings, as Jude and 2 Peter say, God does not pardon them, but instead he pardons righteous people. Noah, who believed God, and just like Abraham, he believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He pardons people who have belief in him, people who obey him, and Peter, J Paul, and Jude, and others are making the point um, that God did not even spare these angelic beings who committed these sins. Instead, he cast them into prison until the judgment day after he wiped them out with the flood. Does that make sense? So let's get back to 1 Peter. Let me summarize it all, and then <laughs> we'll give you some questions to help you kind of process and all those kind of things. You may just need to close your Bible and be like, I don't even know. It's totally up to you. But let's connect all of this back to 1 Peter chapter 3, all right? So, because we got to end this chapter and I want you to see how it all connects. Because, here's verse 20. Because, so he went and Jesus, Spirit of Christ, went and proclaimed, his spirit went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, verse 20, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So I think who these spirits in prison are, they were these fallen angels, the Nephilim, who intermarried with these women who committed, they left their place of authority, they committed sexual immorality, and God put them specifically in a place of judgment, in chains, in hell. And Jesus goes and proclaims to them that sin is defeated, that Satan is defeated, and that they are defeated. And that's who he went and proclaimed. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, 
that as eight persons, Noah and his seven family members, were brought safely through the water. So how does this all connect? Peter is saying this, that just like us and just like Peter's hearers are suffering in an evil day, just like Noah was in an extremely evil day, when you've got these angels intermarrying and these giants intermarrying with these human women, these fallen people, the Nephilim, just like he endured and he believed God and God spared him, if we endure and we believe God in our evil day, we trust God, we seek him as our refuge and our strength and our hope and our salvation, just like Noah escaped the waters of God's judgment, not even these Nephilim escaped it, but just like Noah, who believed God, escaped the waters of judgment and rose above them in this wooden ark. Just like him, you and I, that if we remain, if we endure, if we abide in Christ, if we hold on, hold fast to our confession that Jesus Christ is our Lord, we keep our faith and our hope in him as we suffer in our evil day, we will rise above the waters of judgment. And it won't be through a wooden structure of an ark, it will be through the wooden structure of the cross. And that we will rise above the waters of God's judgment, His wrath poured out on sin. We will escape that, we will rise above it, and just like Noah won, we will win. Why? Because Jesus won. And that's what Peter's getting at. We will, if we endure, if we hold fast to our confession, if we keep our hope and our faith in the finished work of Christ, the person of Christ, that we too will rise above the waters of God's judgment. That's what he's talking about. And then he says this, that they were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal from dirt, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here's what Peter's not saying. If you just rip out that, con that phrase, baptism, uh, which corresponds to this, now saves you, then you'll just go on thinking that baptism is what saves you. And Peter is not saying, let me be clear, that baptism saves you, that being put into some water and coming out of the water saves you. It's not what he's saying. But if you were just to flip to that verse and not know the context of all the stuff that I just said and grab that, you would think baptism saves you. But it's not what he's saying. Look at what he's saying. Baptism, which corresponds to all of this, being righteous by trusting in Christ and being passed safely through the waters and escaping God's judgment. That's what baptism corresponds to. It doesn't bring that. It doesn't equal that. It's a symbol of all of that taking place. Baptism corresponds to being in an evil day, finding your hope and your treasure and your salvation in Christ, escaping the waters of his judgment because of your belief in him. That's what baptism corresponds to. It's a picture of that. It saves you. And, and just in case we thought for somehow this physical act would bring about a spiritual um, effect, which it doesn't. No physical act can bring spiritual change. It takes a spiritual act of God to bring spiritual change. First Peter 1, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. John 3, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is trying to do that physically. He's trying to use a physical act to produce spiritual change. And Jesus says, you can't. You must be born again. He's like, how do I do it? And he says, the wind blows where it wishes. The Holy Spirit produces this new birth in you. Physical actions don't produce a spiritual heart change. Jesus produces a spiritual heart change in people. And he's, just in case we thought that baptism is what saves you, he says, not as a removal of dirt from the body. It's not just going into some water and cleaning the dirt off of you. But here's what saves you. An appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we get baptized, why? Because we are obeying and appealing to God, what he's done. We're showing this act showing the world this act of what God has done, that we put our faith in him, our trust in him, we're appealing to him, we're obeying his word, um, that this is what he has done for us, that we put our faith in him, we trusted him in the evil days, and God allowed the waters of his judgment and um, his wrath to pass over us, 
that we escaped them. We rose above his judgment, um, not by anything we did, not because we built an ark, but because of the cross, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what he's getting at. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace you've been saved, through faith. This is not of your own doing. You can't save yourself by getting dunked in a tank. This is a gift from God, not a result of any works, so that no one can boast. Physical acts do not bring spiritual ends. God is the one who saves us. God is the one who softens people's hearts. God is the one who brings people to salvation. Something spiritual has to be done to you. You've gotta be born again. Peter says, I'm not talking about getting clean in some water. I'm talking about a spiritual act of appealing to God through faith, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he says this about Jesus, who's gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Peter puts the stamp on it and he says, Jesus has gone into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God. And you know who's subject to him? Not just angels, but authorities and powers. These fallen Nephilim, demonic forces, are all subject to Jesus Christ. He's above them all. They've been subjected to him. He has all authority. And Peter is encouraging us with these words and saying, just like Noah won because he trusted God in evil days, you will win as you find your hope in God and you trust in God in our evil days. And he said, God didn't even spare the Nephilim. He spared those who had faith in him. And how are we able to win? Because Jesus Christ has won it for us. He endured in evil days and he obeyed his father and he had no sin and he obeyed perfectly. He won this for us and just like he won and Noah won, if we hold fast to him, we will win in the end too. How do I know that? Because I've read the end of the book. So suffer well, house. Suffer well, find your hope in Christ as you suffer. Peter's gonna continue this theme throughout the rest of the letter but suffer well, wrestle with this text, use scripture to interpret scripture when you're confused. If you don't agree with this interpretation, that's okay because I hold on to it really loosely. But I hope, if anything, this was a good example of how do we let scripture help us interpret scripture? How do we let clearer passages of scripture help us interpret less clear passages of scripture? So. I gotta figure out what we're gonna give you as questions. I have no idea, but you're gonna have some questions by the time you watch this, and we hope it produces some good discussion. If you have another interpretation, please share it. And uh, we hope this is edifying for you and encouraging, and we will see you guys next week.